four. Amen. Get your Bibles out, because we're going, we're going to school today. Amen? Who wants to learn about the Word of God? Amen. Nothing better to do on a Wednesday night than be with God's people. Amen? Well, most of us know 1 Corinthians 13 as the love chapter, right? I, I had it at my wedding, I'll admit. Now I make fun of people who use it, but I use it at mine, because it's not talking about marriage. It's talking about love with Jesus, but it's okay. But I want to argue that 1 John chapter 4 is the most love-filled chapter in the whole Bible. That is an audacious claim, and I, I, I challenge each of you to, to, to fight me on that one, okay? Here's why. In just a short chapter, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is longer. Um, also, there's Psalms that have a lot of love in them, but they're very long. But chapter 4 of 1 John is the shortest chapter with the most amount of love in it. 27 times, 27 times John mentions love in one little chapter. So I think that this is the chapter of love. Somebody say love. Amen. So let's go straight to it because we ain't got that much time tonight. So let's go to chapter one. We're going to break it up into a couple of parts. We're going to start in just verses one through six. And here's the big idea for verses one through six, okay? Children of God love the truth. Somebody say truth. Children of God love the truth. He says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Anybody overcome the world here? Come on. We are overcomers through Jesus Christ. Why? Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. But we are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. All right, man, it got spicy real quick, right? Talking about liars, uh, bad spirits, and the Antichrist right from the get-go. Well, this passage is so important for you. I want you to catch this. It's so important for us to understand it because there are so many people today who claim that they speak for God. Have you seen any of them online, on YouTube, on the radio, in the street corners? Maybe someone stopped you at in and out It's like, I got a word from the Lord from you. Look under your cup. And then it's on 316. You're like, I, I, that was already there, you know? So how do we know, how do we know that God is speaking through a person? Well, John 4, 1 through 6, it gives us a test to figure out how we know that God is speaking through a person. So I want to show you a, a quick graphic real quick. And it's going to give us a four-point test to see how we know if God is speaking through us. It may not be there, but I'll share it with you anyways. The first part of the test is this. Jesus is fully God and fully man. Anyone who claims to be speaking for God needs to acknowledge that Jesus was born in the flesh, that he was fully God and fully human. You see, the people that had come into this church were saying, 
No, no, no. The flesh is evil. Therefore, Jesus could not have been of the flesh because that would make him evil. Therefore, Jesus is only spirit. He's not also a physical being. And this was a heresy that I told you about in chapter one that the church tried to stamp out early on. So anyone who speaks for God needs to recognize that God is, Jesus is God, and that he is fully God and fully man. Amen? Amen. So if a spirit does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that spirit is misleading the people of God. Who has this spirit? I've already thrown these folks under the bus. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, they all deny that Jesus is God. And so does the church that I came from, not light in life, okay, but La Luz del Mundo, the light of the world. They denied that Jesus is God. No wonder they turn out to be terrible institutions that just abuse people and lead millions of people to hell. Number two, whoever listens, you got to listen to, you got to watch it. Who's listening? Who's listening? In this verse, it says, you got to look at the audience. Those who are speaking for God, the people of God listens to them, but those who are speaking lies and are speaking for the devil, they have an audience in the world. The world listens to them and say, wow, that's really good stuff. And us, we're like, "Mm, that don't sit right with me. No, 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 no. But number three, you got to look at their fruits. And that's what verse seven talks about. But also Matthew chapter seven, verse one, Jesus says, "By by their fruits, you will know. And so you have to look at the lifestyle of the person claiming to speak for God. And they have to show fruit. But number four comes from Deuteronomy. This is, a, this is a bonus one. But this is one of the very first tests to know, is a prophet of God really speaking for God? In chapter 13, verse 1, says that it, they have to have accurate predictions. If someone is going around saying the world's going to end in 53 days and it doesn't end in 53 days, they're not speaking for God. They got to be right 100 times out of 100. And in the Old Testament, if you got something wrong and claimed to speak for God, you were stoned to death. We weren't gonna, we're not going to do that today. But that's how seriously God took loving the truth. Children of God love the truth. Amen? So friends, when you hear people claim that they speak for God, which we do believe that God speaks through people today, you need to consider the contents of the message and the life of the proclaimer. The content of the message and the life of the proclaimer and who listens is also important. That's basically the overview of this test for how do I know that this person who claims to speak for God really is doing that. So John starts in this section by saying that we should not believe every spirit Spirit, also another word for it in the Greek is more like an utterance or something that's spoken by someone. We should not believe everything everyone says just because it sounds spiritual. Have you ever heard someone say something and like, that sounds kind of true, but I don't know. I don't know about that, you know? Um, If it doesn't align with the truth of God, then it's not coming from the Lord. You have to discern, was it last night's tacos that's speaking to me? or the spirit of fear, or the spirit of anxiety, or an unholy spirit. But how do we know if God is speaking to us and not Satan? And so have you ever asked yourself that? Like, God, I I just really don't know. This person said that this, 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 and this. And how do I know, Lord God, that you are really speaking? And so what the Bible teaches is, is that Satan comes as an angel of light. And you know what he quotes at us? the Bible. And I'm pretty sure Satan knows the Bible more than most of us. He's been around for how long? Since the beginning, right? He's been around. He knows the scriptures. What did he do when he came to Jesus to test him? He quoted Deuteronomy, the whole book, every every quote, right from the Old Testament, quoting and tempting and trying to trick Jesus. So just because someone comes at you with scriptures or it looks like an angel looks cute, don't mean that they're speaking for God. Amen? Be careful, especially in our TikTok theologian days where anyone can speak for God just because they have a few followers. So another thing to note that is that there are two other places in the Bible that talk about testing spirits. If you're taking notes, you want to read 1 Corinthians 12 verse 10. 
But this is a spiritual gift. It's a gift of discernment between spirits. So there are people within the church who have a special gift to say, that ain't God, that's from the devil, that was what you ate last night. There's that spiritual gift. But you don't have to have that spiritual gift in order to test false and true prophets. John already gave us a test for how we can do that. But also, you also see another parallel passage of testing the spirits in 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 to 21. So take note for those of you. So John warns us, do not believe every spirit because behind every human speaker is one of two supernatural forces. It's, it's either the Holy Spirit or it's the unholy spirit. Amen? Folks, there is a spiritual world behind the physical world. Come on, somebody. There's a spiritual world behind our physical world. You think hearing certain people and podcasts and going to certain... You ever been to a convention that feels religious but is not religious? And you get the heebie-jeebies, you're like, something ain't right here. I'm not selling Tupperware no more for this company. You know what I mean? It's like, this is like a, like a cult trying to get me to sell Tupperware up in here, you know? Man... Because people that speak have a spirit behind them. And our job as Christians is to love the truth and to be able to discern, are you speaking for God or you have another spirit behind you? And we're not off to, to a witch hunt. We're here to make sure that what, what's coming at us is truly from God. Amen? Our tendency today is to look at those false teachers and say, wow, but they have such a great personality. Wow, what a strong, logical argument. What a dynamic person. And if we are not careful, we will be tricked by logic and personality. And many people and many Christians have fallen there too. Folks, the Christian faith is not spiritual gullibility. You need to test the spirits, the unseen spiritual influences that guides people's speech and guide people's actions. Amen? Amen? You see, in today's age of tolerance, discriminating discernment can be viewed as judgmental. But Christians need to be smart enough and wise enough to know when to have discriminating discernment. That's God's discernment. Where you make a judgment, you're not saying I'm better than you, but you're saying that's wrong. That is not from the Lord, and I am not going to receive that. In Jesus' name, you can keep all that stuff. Amen? Jesus also taught us, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So we should be good at judging between what comes from God and what doesn't. A few things that God will never ask someone to do. Let me give you a couple of examples. God will never ask someone to contradict his written word. God will never ask anyone to do something that goes against what the Bible has clearly already taught. For example, God will never ask someone to lie, cheat, steal, or engage in any form of sin. People do that because we're twisted and we're fallen. But also, God will never ask you to cause harm to oneself or to others. God is never speaking to you, take your life, nobody loves you. That is the other false God. That's a voice of Satan, not the voice of our Father. God will also never ask you to act in hate or in revenge because God is love. We're going to get there in a minute. So he would never call someone to act out of malice, hate, or revenge. So if you say, oh, the Lord's called me to go take revenge. No, no, no. That is not the Lord speaking. But also God will never act you to act pridefully or to seek personal glory. You seen the Olympics? The, the, you, you seen the Olympics when people would win, in the, especially in the races. I don't know what's, what's up with those folks. But man, if they would win and they were prideful, seeking personal glory, what would they do? If they were humble and they knew Jesus, what would they do? All oh, glory to him. God will never ask you to seek personal glory or to act pridefully because he is far from the prideful, but he is close to the humble. Amen? So these examples can help you discern between true prompting of the Holy Spirit or false spirits that are misguiding the people of God. 
Let's move on to verses 7 to 12. And here's the idea for this section. God is the source of perfect love. God is the source of perfect love. Let's see what John says. He says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Help me out. Help me read here this evening. Everyone who loves has been born of and knows. Whoever does not love does not know because God is love. Let me, let me clear something up. Love is not God. God is love. Our culture nowadays worships love as a God. And love for them is, means like, if love is love. Isn't that what people say? Love is love. So it don't matter who I love, what I love, love is love. And I have to follow my heart. They're making love an idol. But the Bible tells us, no, love is not God. God is love. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son in the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. I want to take a quick break because only two of you are asking this question, but I'm going to answer it for the two of you. Um, this, this verse has often been used to teach what's called Christian perfection. Christian perfection was actually taught by John Wesley, whom we love, but we just don't agree on this, okay? So even this, let this be a good example that even the people that we love from history, like Martin Luther and John Wesley, John Calvin, they had flaws. They didn't see everything perfectly. And it's okay to agree with some of the things they taught and be like, no, nah, nah, I, don't, I can't roll with that part, okay? So John Wesley taught that Christian perfection or what he called entire sanctification, was the idea that Christians could reach a state of perfect love where their hearts are entirely aligned with God's will. And in this state, a believer would be free from willful sin. In other words, he, he believed that a Christian could reach a point where they no longer sinned intentionally. Now, why do I not believe this? Because I never met someone. I never met someone that did not sin. There was one famous preacher, I won't tell you his name, but he said, I do not sin. I do not remember the last time was that I had to ask God for forgiveness. And my, oh my, was he humbled real quick by the whole Christian community. He later repented and said, yeah, never mind. I do sin. The godliest people I know, Pastor Larry Joe Wachemeyer, Kansas boy from uh, farm boy from Kansas, and Deb Wachemeyer, they're the godliest people I know. They still sin. Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> not, not, like, not like weird stuff, okay? But I've been in their house when Pastor Larry got in trouble with his wife. Yes. Pastor Sean was there too. I'm like, I've shared this story before because it's true. I'm like, should I leave? You know, like, y'all are arguing. They're like, no, you can stay. We want you to hear this. Okay, all right. They always make up. This is a good thing. Christian perfection. So they believe that, he believed that you could be free from willful sin, which is something we should attain for. None of us should be like, well, I, yeah, I'm imperfect. I sin. I'm going to sin tomorrow. You know, at five o'clock, I'm going to sin tomorrow. No, that's not the mind of the Christian. The mind of the Christian is at five o'clock, I will choose God and not sin. But they also believe that it was to be filled with love for God and neighbor. I'm with that. They also believe that it was to experience, that you can experience in this life. Wesley believed that it was possible for Christians to attain this state of perfection in this life, even though he acknowledged that it was rare and often misunderstood. My brother John Wesley, he went through a divorce. That's not good. You know, like, uh, he failed in his marriage. He's not the best. That, I do not look up to him in his marriage. So I'm like, brother, I'm looking at your life, and it ain't, it ain't perfect. So why are you teaching this? You know, come on, bro. So what does it mean? What do we believe that it does mean? This idea that God's love is made complete, or another version says perfected in us perfected in us. The phrase, his love is made complete or perfected in us, speaks to the idea that love reaches its full expression or completion when it is shared among a Christian community. Love reaches its full expression when it is 
shared among believers. And this is why it's so hard, maybe even impossible, to follow God passionately and do it in isolation. You can't do life apart from a loving community because in community is how we see God through one another as we love one another. This doesn't mean that God, God's love is perfected, is imperfect without us or that he needs us in order for his love to be perfect, but that the purpose of God's love is fulfilled when it leads one another to love each other. Love is not complete unless it results in outward action. You can't just say, I love you, bro. Sucks for you. Got to sleep outside in the cold, but I love you. May, may the Lord keep you warm. All right? You're hungry. May the Lord feed you, brother. I love you. We can't do that. But perfect love is demonstrated as we say, what can I do to serve you? Amen? So while, let me clear this up. While Methodists, modern Methodists, respect Wesley's teachings on Christian perfection, we see it today more as an ongoing journey of sanctification rather than a definitive, attainable state of perfection in this life. And in fact, it could be dangerous to get to a point where you think you've not sinned anymore. There's people out there. Just ask them, do you think you're a good person or a bad person? Oh, I'm a good person, never kill nobody. Okay, wow, well, that's your, that's your standard for being a good person. You never kill nobody? Okay. Man, a lot of people think they don't sin because they're defining what sin is for themselves, but only God can define that. Amen? 1 John 4, 8 says that those people do not know God because God is love. You see, the person who lacks love shows themselves to be unchanged at the core of being by the gospel message. The person who lacks love cannot say, I know God. In fact, he says, you do not know God if you do not have an outward expression of love for your brothers and sisters in the faith. John continues in verse 10, and he says this beautiful thing. He says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, God's love sets the standard for the love that Christians are called to embody. His love is the standard for us. I love using the example of Christian marriage and why I'm a huge proponent that if you are dating, you're living together, you're sleeping together, you should get married. Come talk to us. I just did a wedding two weeks ago. It, was, it took five minutes, and it was legally done, okay? We can do it, okay? But here's why. Because today people are like, oh, well, we love each other. You know, we love each other. So isn't that enough? No. Christian marriage is the best, period. Yes. Christian marriage is the best kind of marriage period. I will fight anyone on that. Why? Because we have an agreed upon standard that we are both called to live out within that marriage. And that standard is Jesus. When you are not married under the eyes of God and you're not, you're not seeing eye to eye on what you've agreed to, a person can say, well, I love you according to my own standard. Well, I love you according to how I view what love is. But when you submit yourself to God, the God of the Bible, and say, Lord, my standard and my aim in this marriage is to be like Jesus. And for the wife to say, Lord, my my aim is to be like the church, which is what Ephesians talks about, those roles. Man, now our standard is perfect love. So anytime we fall short of perfect love, there should be repentance. And there should be a contriteness of heart. And there should be apologies. And there should be, Holy Spirit, help me be the kind of person that you've called me to be. But people who do not have the standard of God's love, it's a very dangerous place to be. Because everyone can just define what love is for themselves. Amen? So as a husband, I'm called to live like Jesus in my marriage. Wow, that is a high calling It's a calling to perfection. Am I perfect? No, but that keeps me humble every single day. And it keeps me so close to Jesus that I never want to leave his sight. So Jesus is a standard, not only in marriage, but for every and any Christian. So love is not an abstract idea in the Bible. God's love is not an abstract principle or sentiment, but was made manifest 
By the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, who did what? He died for you. Did you deserve it? No, you didn't deserve it. That should have been like a no. Did you deserve it? No, No, none of us deserve Jesus dying for us, but he still did it for us. So Jesus is the standard of what love is. You die for one another. You put yourself last. You put everybody else first, even in the Costco line. You let people cut. (laughs) Have you ever let someone cut at Costco gas? And then you ain't being sanctified. (laughs) Only those who have let someone cut are being sanctified. You just be like, please. And you too, please. (laughs) That's how you know that God is at work. That's my epistle. (laughs) That's how you know you let people cut. Um, also another place that you let them cut, you know, when, you know, when you're going to get off, uh, on a, like on an exit ramp and they're those people that wait till the last minute. If you let them in, you know, God lives in you, (laughs) but you know, when you're not with Jesus, you're like almost touching the car in front of you and you're not going to look at them, just looking for it. That's how, you know, the spirit is at work in your life. The other spirit, the other spirit. All right, moving on. Verses 13 to 16. We've got a few minutes and more verses. Okay, verse 13 to 16. Here's a big idea. God lives in you as you live in love. God lives in you as you live in love. Verse 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. That's a capital S. That's a Holy Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent Jesus, his Son, to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they know God. And so we know and rely on the love of God that God has for us. God is love. Again, whoever lives in love lives in God, and God is in them. This is how love is made complete or perfect among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Wow. For some of you, this idea of God living in us and us in God is a new, it's a new concept. But, but, but for those of us who've been walking with Jesus, we know that the moment something happens, the moment that you trusted in Jesus, how many of you remember the moment that you gave your life to Jesus? Uh, for some of us, it was more of a season, perhaps, and you can't put a date and a time. But I, I know that for me, it was when I got baptized in, in, in 2008, in January 2008, in Santa Barbara, and I was ready to just go party and do that lifestyle. I was like, finally, my mom does not rule my life. I'm going to go rule my own life. And then Jesus wrecked my life. And he's like, we're going to go party a different kind of way, Joel. But I remember that day. It was freezing cold. I gave my life to Jesus, and it was a turning point for me. It was a turning point for me. And, and, and the promise is that when you put your faith in Jesus, at that moment, God's spirit lives in you, begins to live in you. And now our job is to live in him. He lives in me. I live in him. It's abiding one with the other. So this is a metaphor for how our relationship with God is supposed to look, look like. So if you do not know Jesus... I can tell you one thing's for sure. Your life is empty. Your life is empty. You're overcome by depression and dark thoughts and your past and what you've done and what's been done to you. You're empty. And some people have other spirits in them. But God, by turning to him, by receiving his love, by confessing your sins, by accepting Jesus, you become a child of God who now lives in you by the power of his spirit. Amen? And so every Christian has two witnesses of their salvation. Two witnesses of their salvation. One is an internal one. That's the Holy Spirit who witnesses to our own spirit that we are children of God. Remember what what a Roman says, the spirit cries out, what? Abba, Father. Our spirit 
within us cries out to the Holy Spirit who's also within us and testifies to us, I belong to you, God. I know. I know I'm messed up, Lord, but I know that I also belong to you. So the Spirit living in us is an internal witness that you actually belong to God. Um, and, and then there's another witness, and that's an outward witness, and that is what John says, whoever publicly, continually acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, then God's love truly lives in them and them in God. And so there's an aspect that, yes, the Holy Spirit lives in me, and I can know if I have Christ in me or not, but also you need to be a person who continually confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. I don't mean you carry a megaphone and just yell and be weird about it, like, Jesus is the Lord of God, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus, no, but that your life continually is demonstrating, God, Jesus is my God. I serve him. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. It's about a continual, continual, continual confession. It's not just like I was five years old and I confessed 30 years ago that Jesus was Lord. It's about continuing to be in him. Amen? Amen. Another fruit of love in our lives, John says, is that we have a God-like confidence. We do not have to be afraid on Judgment Day. Anybody excited about that? Judgment Day ain't going to be nothing like that movie with Will Smith, okay? Like we're talking about actual scary times. But for those of us who know God and have God in our lives, we do not have to be afraid because our sins are forgiven. And when we face God, we will enjoy him for the rest of our lives. Amen? Amen. All right, the last three verses. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Here's that idea of perfection again. So there's no fear in love. Friends, we do not have to be afraid of God, but we can fear him. We should revere him. We should fall on our face every once in a while and say, God, you are God and I am not. And I deserve to be removed from this earth. But you have shown me so much love and so much mercy. And so there's that healthy fear. But we shouldn't be afraid of God. Because God is love. And his love is perfected in us. And so if you have an unhealthy view of who God is, if you're actually afraid of God, Come talk to somebody, get some prayer. We'd love to teach you what the Bible teaches about God. We're doing that right now. But we'd love to get you to a place where you have a trusting relationship with God and where fear is being removed from your life. Not just, not just fear of God, but fear of man and fear of the future, and fear of elections. Some of y'all are way too wrapped up in those things, and you're so afraid. You don't have to be afraid when you have God in you. Amen? And here's the last three verses, verses 19 to 21. We love because he first loved us. We show grace because he first showed us grace. We forgive because he first forgave us. We can be patient because he was first patient with us. We can give because he first gave to us. I can serve because he first served me. This is the gospel. The gospel is that God loved you first before you ever did a single thing for him. Before you even searched for him, he already loved you. And by his love, he drew you to salvation. And he did all this not because you are great, not because you can sing well, not because you sinned less than your neighbor, but because God is love. And so none of us can say, I'm the most loving Christian that I know. None of you should ever say that because apart from God, we are, we're nothing. We're incapable of doing good things with a pure heart and motive. We love because he first loved us. Verse 20, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. You like people calling you a liar? 
that one hurts, huh? Some of y'all get triggered by that. But if you currently hate a Christian brother or sister, then the scripture's saying, you're a liar. Because you're not living in the truth. You're not allowing the love of God to, to remind you of how humble you should be and how kind you should be and how willing to forgive others you should be. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. I want to be living in the truth. How about you? I want to be, I don't want to be a liar. I want to be someone who speaks the truth. And so we cannot hate. There is no room for hate in the kingdom of God. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. I want us to stand as we close this evening. And because this, because this idea of loving one another is such a key to truly belonging to God, I think that as everyone just bows your head and closes your eyes, I just want to give us an opportunity to confess and to let go of hatred. I just need you to search your heart right now and say, is there anyone that I hate? Is there anyone that I wish evil upon? Is there anyone that I want to take revenge on? Is there anyone about whom I'm lying and dragging their name through the mud? Is there anyone that I am plotting against in the workplace? Is there anyone that I am speaking ill about and spreading lies and rumors or even truths about them? Is there anyone that I remotely hate? I just want you to take a moment right now and say, Lord, I, forgive me. God, thank you that you forgave me and I can forgive my enemies. And not only that, you, you can do more, Jesus says, to pray and bless your enemies. And so, Lord, we pray right now for our enemies or those who we view as our enemies. And we say, God, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would bless them through salvation, that they would come to know the love that we have come to know, but that you would begin with us and our hearts, oh Lord. I don't want anyone in this room, Lord, to leave with hatred in their heart because if they do, then you say that they are liars. But rather, let us be children who love the truth, who confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, who live in love and in God. Children, who live out of love and who are growing over time. And so if you, if you like me, know there's an area of your life where you got to grow in love, would you raise your hand? I want to bless us as we just close tonight. If you're like, I, I'm lacking love here, there, for this person, for this situation, or even for God, Lord, I pray that you would increase our love as we are reminded tonight that we can only love because you first loved us you are not like manipulative people who say I will love you if you do this for me but you first loved us with actions not with words with actions and now you speak words over us God I pray for those tonight that feel like they are unlovable I just sense there's a few people Lord tonight that feel unlovable and I pray God that they would say no to the lie of the enemy. That is a lie from the pit of hell, Lord God. No one is unlovable for you loved the world and you gave your life for everyone, Lord. And I pray that tonight they would receive the lavish love of God in Jesus. So we thank you, God, for all that you've done this evening from the worship, God, to the prayer time. 
Thank you that you're ministering to us and thank you that everyone here tonight has no excuse but to leave with a stronger knowledge of your love. We pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. Can we give thanks to the God of love tonight? Love one another, amen? Would you open your hands? I want to bless you. Lord, I bless your people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that they would walk in your love, that they would do no harm, and that they would stay in love with you for the rest of their days. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you.